Idlewild was a developer's name for a resort and golf club on Jamaica Bay, and it provided the unofficial name for the airport that was being planned there. Imagine yourself on the ramp at New York's Idlewild Airport in the spring of 1968. Turbofan wine mixes with the rattle of catering trucks while a forest of silver tails glints under the midday sun. The future looks limitless, but only if the math works. And on the balance sheets of airlines everywhere, the math is groaning under the weight of the 60-minute rule. In plain language, that Federal Aviation Administration regulation said this, If your airliner had only two engines, it must stay within an hour's flying time of a runway long enough to handle an emergency landing. In practice, the rule encircled twin jets inside an invisible cage that shrank the Atlantic Ocean into a no-go zone and turned polar routes into cartographic fantasies. For airlines desperate to surf the post-war travel boom, the 60-minute limit felt like a lead weight chained to their wings. Quad jets, such as the Boeing 707 and the Douglas DC-8, did leap across oceans, but they guzzled kerosene like steamships drank coal. Their four-engine redundancy made regulators happy, yet their fuel burns and maintenance bills slaughtered profit margins on anything less than the thickest trunk routes – London to New York, Tokyo to Los Angeles, Sydney to Singapore. Meanwhile, a rising middle class had begun asking for non-stop flights between what the industry politely called secondary cities. Dallas Frankfurt, Copenhagen Montreal, Osaka Honolulu. Those pairs could not consistently fill a 400-seat 747, but they were far too long for the 727s and 737s tethered to coastal hopscotching. That left aircraft manufacturers staring at a riddle. How do you give an airliner the reach of a four-holer while charging airlines for only three engine overhauls and, in theory, burning 25% less fuel? The answer arrived in two stages. First came the Boeing 727, rolled out in 1963 with a T-tail and a third Pratt & Whitney JT-8D buried inside the vertical stabilizer. The 727 had been designed for short runways and high-altitude airports, Denver, Mexico City, La Paz, where the older 707s risked clipping antennas on hotel roofs. But its sales figures, 1,832 airframes, a record for the era, told manufacturers something more valuable than any wind tunnel test. Airlines liked the safety optics of an extra engine almost as much as they liked the flexibility of a smaller jet that could still hop puddles of open water. Still, the single-aisle 727 was only a proof of concept. The true brass ring lay in a wide-body trijet, able to carry 250 passengers across an ocean with a ticket price undercutting the 747s by millions. And while Boeing flirted with design studies, two other U.S. giants were already sketching blueprints. Lockheed, returning to passenger aircraft after the Electra debacle, needed a masterpiece to reclaim credibility. McDonnell Douglas, flush from the DC-8, DC-9, and the newly merged Douglas Heritage, wanted to leapfrog Boeing's hold on intercontinental travel. Both knew the regulatory arithmetic. Three engines bought freedom. Two could not yet earn it. Thus, the stage was set for an engineering duel that would redefine long-haul aviation. Not because the world truly needed three engines, but because, at that instant, it had no better option. When American Airlines issued its 1968 request for a smaller, cost-efficient, long-range, wide body, it might as well have fired a starter pistol. Within 12 months, two very different aircraft had rolled out of design offices, their fuselages barely on paper, and their marketing departments already in full swing. Lockheed L-1011 TriStar, the Rolls-Royce of the skies. McDonnell Douglas DC-10, the dependable workhorse with room to grow. Both proposals hit the same bullet points. Three high-bypass turbofans, two under the wings and one at the tail, twin aisle cabin, 250 to 300 seats, non-stop New York-Paris range. But each manufacturer solved the tail mount puzzle in a radically different way. Lockheed's engineers, led by the visionary Kelly Johnson alumni who had migrated from the Skunk Works, invented the S-duct, a sinuous double-curved intake that carried air up the belly of the fin and into a Rolls-Royce RB211 engine. The shape kept airflow attached, reduced pressure losses, and preserved the L-1011's sleek silhouette. Pilots raved about the handling and passengers loved the whisper-quiet cabin thanks to that snugly buried center engine. The cost? 
additional structure, weight, and maintenance hours that would later haunt accountants. McDonnell Douglas answered the same requirement with blunt pragmatism, a straight inlet running above the aft fuselage into a General Electric CF6. The geometry looked bulkier and created a characteristic hump, but it cost fewer production hours and simplified access panels. Airlines saw rugged simplicity, flight crews saw familiar Douglas instrumentation, and the DC-10 began collecting orders from carriers that Lockheed couldn't court fast enough. Under the skin, both jets were marvels. The L-1011 debuted triple redundant flyby cable hydraulics and the commercial world's first Category 2C auto land approval. Capable of touching down in fog so thick ground crews joked they needed braille to find the taxiway. The DC-10, meanwhile, came in multiple fuselage stretches and convertible freighter versions, delivering cargo doors wide enough to load race cars and drilling rigs intact. Thanks to that third engine, each aircraft could plot routes straight through the belly of the Atlantic or kiss the northern edge of the Pacific, opening city pairs that had never seen nonstop service. Chester Orlando, Osaka Cairns, Lagos Rio, Airlines minted new markets almost overnight, and for a moment, the Trijet felt like the Goldilocks solution. More economical than four engines, more liberated than two. Yet, deep inside airline maintenance hangars, the compromises were already tallying in red ink. Specialized scaffolding, had to be leased whenever the tail engine came due for a borescope. Fuel planners complained the S-duct cost a full row of revenue passengers on ultra-long segments. And in high utilization fleets, three engines meant three complete overhaul cycles for every heavy check. But the customer bookings kept rolling. Regulators remained satisfied and fuel was still cheap enough in the early 1970s that nobody asked too many questions. Until the economy, the oil market, and the state of engine technology shifted beneath the Trijet's landing gear. Engineers love to say that technology never moves in straight lines. It jumps. In the late 1970s, Turbofan reliability didn't just inch forward, it pole vaulted. Meantime, between in-flight shutdowns reached numbers safety analysts had once dismissed as science fiction. One failure per 100,000 flight hours and falling. Suddenly, the basic premise of the three-engine workaround began to crack. The first fissure arrived on railway station notice boards rather than cockpit gauges. In 1973, the Yom Kippur War triggered an oil embargo, quadrupling jet A prices. Overnight, every excess kilogram of fuel burn showed up on balance sheets in bright scarlet. Operators still young in their DC-10 leases watched quarterly budgets bleed, while regional competitors with newer twin-engine A300s grinned across the apron. Then, on the 25th May 1979, tragedy struck that the Trijet image could never quite shake. American Airlines Flight 191, a DC-10 departing Chicago O'Hare, shed its left engine on rotation after an improperly torqued pylon bolt cracked under takeoff loads. Severed hydraulic lines retracted wing slats the aircraft rolled past 100 degrees of bank and 273 souls were lost in the worst aviation accident on U.S. soil. Investigators blamed maintenance error rather than design, but newspaper headlines don't nuance engineering diagrams. Overnight, public confidence in the three-engined wonder plane evaporated. Yet the coup de grace arrived not from the media, but from the same regulator that had once birthed the Trijet niche, 
In 1985, the FAA introduced ETOPS 120. If your twin jet met stringent fire suppression, electrical bus, and engine monitoring criteria, you could stray two full hours from a diversion airport. By 1988, the bar lifted to ETOPS 180. The oceanic monopoly of trijays and quad jets vanished like contrails in a headwind. In economic terms, the calculus was ruthless. Two engines burned 25 to 30 percent less fuel than three. Two engines require one-third fewer overhauls. Two engines free roughly four to six percent of maximum takeoff weight that can be traded for payload or longer range. A single modern GE-90 on the Boeing 777 churned out more thrust than all three. See F-66Ds on an early DC-10 combined. While sipping kerosene at specific fuel consumptions the designers of 1968 could only dream about. While sipping kerosene at specific fuel consumptions, the designers of 1968 could only dream about. From an airline CFO's perspective, paying to drag a redundant third engine across 5,000 nautical miles made as much sense as buying three spare tires for every car in the fleet. The final nail came from passengers themselves. Surveys in the early 1990s revealed that cabin upgrades, flatbed seats, seatback screens, quieter interiors, ranked higher than number of engines on perceived safety. Once that psychological domino tipped, the Trijet had few allies left outside nostalgia-laden flight decks. McDonnell Douglas attempted one last charge with the MD-11, a stretched, wingletted, glass cockpit DC-10 derivative that promised 10% better fuel burn and a fully automated flight deck. But promises met physics and came up short. The aircraft missed payload range targets, arrived in the teeth of a global recession, and sold just 200 units before Boeing's merger with McDonnell Douglas killed the line in 2000. Cargo operators gave the Trijet a graceful afterlife. FedEx, UPS, and Lufthansa Cargo exploited the MD-11's cavernous belly volume for express parcels, while aerial firefighting firms converted retired DC-10s into water bombers, capable of dropping 12,000 gallons on forest infernos. Even so, by 2014, when KLM ferried its final passenger MD-11 to retirement, the writing was etched into the desert sand around Victorville and Mojave. Yet to dismiss the Trijet as a failed evolutionary branch is to misread history. Its real purpose was never to revolutionize aerodynamics. It was to bridge a regulatory and technological gap. In doing so, the L-1011 and DC-10 proved four crucial ideas that every long-range twin now inherits. Medium-sized widebodies are economically viable, on routes once thought to demand 400 seats. Integrated auto land and advanced system redundancy belong in commercial cockpits, not just military prototypes. Psychological safety is malleable. Convince the flying public once, and you can convince them again. Regulations evolve with technology, not the other way around. What feels non-negotiable today can be a museum exhibit tomorrow. Walk onto a 787-9 idling in the gate at Amsterdam Schiphol, destination Bali. Two engines, each capable of crossing the Pacific on one if the other decides to take the night off. ETOPS 370 clearance, humidity controlled composite fuselage, cabin altitude set to 6,000 feet. That aircraft exists precisely because a generation earlier, the Trijet made regulators comfortable extending runways of safety into the sky. That aircraft exists precisely because a generation earlier, the Trijet made regulators comfortable extending runways of safety into the sky itself. So when you next spot a retired TriStar basking in the Mojave sun, its paint chalky, its S-duct gaping at the desert, Remember that it is not just an artifact. It is a mile marker on aviation's learning curve, proof that compromise can be elegant, temporary, and utterly transformative. If stories like this scratch your aeronautical itch, subscribe 
ping that notification bell, and join us next time as we chase another forgotten detour on the flight path of human progress. Until then, keep looking up, because every contrail you see, no matter how many engines made it, owes something to the idea that once upon a time, three was the perfect number.